Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back to the stage General Bob Wood. All right, that's right. I sure appreciate all the applause. Thank you very much. Uh, well, really, thanks again to all of you. Hopefully you had a good breakfast and uh, good coffee up. Uh, what we have is a fantastic keynoter at this point. Uh, really glad to bring this uh, gentleman to the stage, leader in the area, responsible for an enormous amount of uh, uh, mission that uh, the Air Force has uh, pre presented him, and a wonderful workforce, 6,600 engineers and workers and admin, but a remarkable technical strength of our nation about four blocks from here. And we thank you all for coming today and allowing us to bring forward this, uh, this presentation and, and do it with, uh, in mind, the communications for the 21st century. Point out the questions again. If you have questions, just uh, it's askmemilcom at gmail.com, and we will be able to take questions at the end. About 45 minutes, uh, time for uh, some remarks from General Thompson, but also some questions from you. I know he's very interested and what's on your mind and what you may wish to ask. General Thompson is the commander of the Space and Missile Systems Center. Uh, he is the Air Force PEO for space, pretty interesting subject these days and getting more interest, interesting by the day. Managing research, design, development, acquisition, and sustainment of satellites and their command and control systems. Uh, not news for most of you in this room, but it's an incredibly energetic, busy program of launches and, and um, the variety of missions that are being uh, regenerated or recapitalized or put new, a new up in space. He's a graduate of the Air Force Academy, St. Mary's University, and multiple Air and Joint Colleges, uh, a leader in this Air Force, a leader for our nation. Please join me in welcoming General Thompson to the stage. All right, good morning. Okay, we need more enthusiasm than that. Come on. All right, how many folks from the East Coast? Raise your hand. All right, welcome to the West Coast. All right, I apologize. We did have a little morning fog this morning. We'll probably have morning fog uh, a couple more times this week. But if you're in town and you're from New York or Boston or Pittsburgh or the National Capital Region, I am guaranteeing you way better weather out here, okay? Um, that fog will burn off this afternoon and it will be gloriously sunny uh, with highs in the uh, mid-70s. You will definitely enjoy your time here. So when you take a break, when you ha it get to imbibe in some of that dessert that uh, uh, General Wood was talking about earlier, uh, please uh, take it outside and, uh, and enjoy the weather here in Southern California. I was talking at, the, uh, at breakfast this morning about what it's like to be out here on the uh, West Coast. And it's pretty cool if you're the space guy uh, for the United States Air Force because most of your contractors are right here in the local area. So uh, I, have about, I spend about uh, $7 billion a year uh, for uh, the Department of Defense in the space realm. It's about 85% of the uh, DOD space budget for materiel. And at any one time, about $15 billion uh, is executing just within a couple of miles of my base. So it's pretty cool to have uh, uh, many of my uh, industry partners uh, out here so close with us uh, uh, in Los Angeles. And it's also cool because about 2.30, 3 o'clock every afternoon, the emails stop flowing from the Pentagon. And so I can actually get some work done, me and my team. Um, I guess the downside to that is by the time we get into work, uh, we got, they got three hours head start on us uh, uh, from, uh, from the National Capital Region uh, sending us taskers. In any case, thanks for uh, this opportunity to address you all today. Um, thanks to uh, AFSIA and uh, thanks to the IEEE uh, Communications Society for sponsoring the event. Uh, thanks for all of you for attending, and uh, General Shea and uh, General Wood, thanks very much, uh, Bob and Bob. Uh, thanks for uh, uh, having your team uh, pull this together for us. Uh, uh, really look forward to the next couple of days' worth of interaction um, in this domain. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit today about uh, what's going on in, uh, uh, in the United States Air Force relative to uh, SATCOM. Uh, I'm going to uh, uh, maybe pre- 
uh, view some of the things that you will hear from uh, uh, other members of my team over the next couple of days. Um, and uh, you'll see on the chart there this concept of epic speed. And we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, during my remarks. Um, but first, and I find, find this ironic that a United States Air Force officer is going to get up here on stage and the two gentlemen that preceded him on stage are a United States Marine Corps officer and a United States Army officer. Next chart, please. I'm going to talk about a United States Naval officer. All right, Alfred T. Mahan. So um, an American uh, naval officer from just after the Civil War and a historian, Alfred uh, T. Mahan, uh, in his book, The Influence of Sea Power Upon History, which was uh, uh, published in 1890. Uh, one of the things that it talked about very uh, exclusively in this book was the fact that uh, our military and economic strength is really, uh, uh, in large part at that time, dependent upon the strength of, uh, of the naval forces of the country at that time. Mahan was a veteran of the Civil War and an officer uh, for nearly 40 years. He analyzed conflicts of navies uh, from Europe and the Americas uh, from the dawn of transoceanic sailing all the way through the American Revolution. And his book highlights the importance of maintaining a strong naval force in order for a nation to control lines of communications. Military communication, the transmission of information from military commanders to men and women on the front lines is the most important component of a strong and resilient military, something that the United States military, all branches, have been experiencing for centuries. It's so important to have that, uh, those good lines of communication that before the advent of radio signaling, armies, navies, and early air forces actually employed messengers to hand deliver information. They also uh, uh, delivered telegraph cables to the front lines and they even brought along, as uh, one of those pictures uh, articulates, some carrier pigeons. Uh, I guess we could call that early agility. Um, I wonder who the acquisition people were responsible for purchasing carrier pigeons. In any case, the United States understood this uh, importance of military communications and our army was the first in the world to have a separate communications branch, a signal corps uh, established in uh, 1860. We'd go on to establish in that signal corps in the early 1900s an aeronautical division that would evolve into the United States Air Force. Our roots include advancing military communications technology, for sure. Space, as the ultimate high ground, quickly became the next frontier of faster communications technology as our responsibilities around the globe continued to grow. So if you look in the lower right hand corner there, you'll see the signal communications by orbiting relay equipment or the SCORE rocket. SCORE showed that the United States Air Force could move fast in the face of a changing adversary and threat environment to develop capability that placed the United States on an even technological playing field with, at that time, the Soviet Union as a response to both Sputnik 1 and Sputnik 2. It launched aboard an Atlas rocket on 18 December 1958 and SCORE provided the first test of communications relay system on orbit as well as the first successful use of the Atlas launch vehicle which a generation of is still flying today. It captured world attention by broadcasting a Christmas message via shortwave radio from President Eisenhower through an onboard tape recorder. That broadcast was fairly weak. It was only uh, very sensitive radio receivers were able to detect it. But most people heard the message because it was broadcast over our news programs uh, here in the United States. That six month effort for SCORE proved that a small, highly focused and versatile research group with appropriate resources could achieve scientific and technological advances necessary to succeed in the emerging global space race. And that small group was a predecessor to the Air Force's Space and Missile Systems Center, which I'm privileged to command today. Also there in the lower right-hand corner of that chart is the Lincoln Experimental Satellite. It's an example of what we need to do to take risks and to prototype capabilities to further technology advancement. LES, as it was known, accomplished in 
accomplished super high frequency space communications and opened up a part of the electronic magnetic spectrum that is still heavily used today. The LES series was designed and built by Lincoln Laboratory and MIT between 1965 and 1976 under USAF sponsorship uh, for testing new devices and techniques for satellite communications. Those of you who are familiar with some of the things that Space and Missile Systems Center is currently doing in the prototyping realm, a couple of things I will talk about here. We take our lineage from those kinds of works done in the 65 to 76 time frame. Most of the challenges that LES was trying to solve were to address high uh, efficiency spacecraft transmitters in the download frequency bands. Even though many of the satellites suffered from launch problems, in other words, they, su they, uh, they either spectacularly failed or they uh, uh, perhaps got put into the wrong orbit, they still proved the value of that super high frequency communications and doing it from the space domain. Currently, we're capable of instant communication with all of our assets half a world away in the United States Air Force. We're used to it. Maybe we become a little bit soft because, hey, it's always there for us. It's always easy. Our adversaries know how much we depend on, as a nation on space, and not just our military, but for the day-to-day -day necessities that keep our economy and our livelihoods going. For those of you who may have gotten here this morning uh, and uh, uh, used your iPhone or your Samsung phone to navigate your way here, you did not get here courtesy of Apple. You got here courtesy of the United States Air Force GPS constellation that communicated with your iPhone and got you the turn-by-turn -turn directions that you needed. Banks, air travel, shipping, our basic infrastructure networks all rely on the assets that we put up in space. Those very vital and recognized capabilities. Some of our adversaries, in fact, seek to deny our freedom of movement in the space domain. It's no longer benign up there. If you've heard Secretary Wilson and General Goldfein, my bosses, talk about it, it's congested and it's contested on orbit currently. And we've got to make sure that what we do enables us to fight through that environment, both for the good of our United States military and the good of our economy. It used to be that space was a domain through which communication to fight better was primarily a terrestrial problem. But now, some of that conflict occurs on orbit. What was once a domain accessible only by a few nation states is now accessible by many nations and non-state actors alike. The last time I checked, there were over 50 spacefaring nations, and that number grows every day. Unfortunately, not all of those 50 plus nations that are spacefaring are friendly to the United States, our way of life, and our allies. We're at a strategic inflection point in military space, and that's something the team at Space and Missile Systems Center takes to heart every day as we acquire, build, design and sustain new space capabilities. We consider military satellite communications a vital interest to the United States, as should you, and that's critical for accurate, timely, and reliable space operations. If an adversary interferes with any of those critical assets, we will respond at a time, place, manner, and domain of our choosing. And I'm sure many of you have heard uh, leaders far superior to me uh, say those very words. We need to be able to fight and defend ourselves in space, and we do that by deploying an agile, resilient, and secure C4 space architecture. Current MILSOM, MILCOM, MILSATCOM architectures uh, limit agility, resilience, and scrutiny because there are different types of SATCOM for different missions. Each frequency band, protected, wideband, narrowband, has special characteristics that differentiate one from another and make it better suited for a particular service. Each satellite system has a particular ground terminal that supports communications over that frequency spectrum. Hmm. It's interesting that uh, uh, many of the things that we thought were perfect and would be perfect for eternity are no longer so perfect when you consider space being a contested domain. 
For decades, the Air Force has led efforts to expand satellite communications capabilities for our warfighters. From the advent in the early 1960s, late to Milstar in the 1990s, wideband global satcom in the late 2000s, and advanced extremely high frequency in the 2010s. In fact, we just had a uh, AEHF satellite launch uh, last week. The Air Force has provided launch vehicles, supporting infrastructure, and most of the communications satellites for our defense community. During these times, the USAF has confronted a variety of technical, political, and institutional challenges. These focused initially on long-range strategic communications requirements, but increasingly on tactical needs after the first warfighter transmissions of voice and data from Vietnam to Washington, D.C. via satellite. The USAF often led their commercial counterparts as they probed the boundaries of high-risk technology in an effort to increase payload capabilities. Unlike providers of commercial satellite communication services, however, the USAF has survivability and unique requirements that increase military satellite costs and development schedules. Next chart, please. There are ways to look at the architecture smartly to leverage satellite communications, the satellite communications industry to benefit from lower costs and schedules, to find the right fit in the right threat environment. We all know those things. We're all working those things on a day in and day out, day out basis. At this strategic inflection point that I mentioned earlier, the Space and Missile Systems Center must adapt in order to maintain our nation's superior space technical capabilities. That's what SMC 2.0 is all about. As a center, we've got to be more innovative. We've got to work better as an enterprise, and we have to be able to shift our cultural mindset. We've got to strengthen our partnerships with allies and you, the U.S. space industry. Above all, we've got to move faster, and we have to keep our adversaries backpedaling. We've got to do more innovative things, and we've got to do them more quickly. Our 2.0 initiative is predicated on enterprise, partnership, innovation, culture, and speed, which we call epic speed. In SATCOM, particularly MILSATCOM, epic speed means incorporating more modularity with various host platforms, such as the Enterprise Ground System, and protected tactical anti-jam SATCOM, or PATS. Ground enterprises to promote interoperability are things of the future. Not every satellite or satellite system, whether it's communications or not, needs to have its own independent ground system. We need to be able to do things more as an enterprise. We've got to continue our current partnerships that we've got with various allies around the world. In WGS, allies like Australia, Canada, Denmark, New Zealand, the Netherlands, Luxembourg, Norway, and the Czech Republic. Satellites like the AEHF satellite mentioned earlier with Canada, the Netherlands, and Great Britain. We've got to explore new partnerships like we're trying to do with Arctic MILSATCOM with Norway and NATO. We've got to innovate and collaborate with industry, government, and academia on prototypes at all segments, space, ground, and user. We've got to promote a culture of smart risk-taking to encourage better innovation. If we are guaranteed success, then we're not taking enough risk as we're building and delivering those new capabilities. And we've got to be able to capitalize on reducing our bureaucracy and greater authority to make decisions and go fast. The future of MILSATCOM will include a diverse and redundant providers, a concept, an environment, a community that in blends military, commercial, and international partners, a variety of platforms and systems, dedicated, hosted, and managed services. SMC 2.0, which we just declared IOC on here uh, two weeks ago, means real change is on the horizon in these areas. Other areas that we've got to uh, uh, capitalize on, multi-spectral bands and orbits, various business models and services, leasing, long-term services, buy-ins. 
there are ways to continue as a nation to be innovative and get moving in satellite communications. It's not just for our benefit, it's for the benefit of our military, our allies, and all of our citizens. Next chart, please. Many of you may have seen this diagram already. For those of you who haven't, we're just building on an architecture, a new framework under SMC 2.0. Over time, due to decades of operating in a relatively benign space domain, SMC at all levels developed an aversion to risk. But it was so we could build large, exquisite space systems and do them perfectly. Those exquisite systems in today's environment, if you've listened to General Hyten, the commander of US STRATCOM talk, are just big, juicy targets. We have a two-track strategy to get out ahead of this. Track one focuses on protecting and defending our national security space architecture against projected threats. Robust space situational awareness is critical to maintain MILSATCOM capabilities fundamental to the conduct of all space operations in an increasingly contested, degraded, or operationally limited space environment. Our track two seeks innovation and partnership opportunities to fundamentally change space acquisition strategies with alternative architecture approaches, large commercial constellations, hosted payloads, small sats, rapid prototyping, you name it. We're interested in all of that. To achieve this strategy and accomplish faster acquisitions, we're not shifting programs and per we're now shifting uh, our programs and our personnel into a core structure as articulated on this chart. That core structure, people will report to core PEOs. So yes, I will, I will remain as the Air Force's PEO for space, but we've added three more PEOs to take out management layers and push decision makers closer to the workforce so that we can go faster. Examples of MILSATCOM programs that are already benefiting from SMC 2.0 authorities, the enhanced polar system recapitalization effort is taking advantage of our streamlining and rapid acquisition and taking advantage of international partnerships with the nation of Norway. Our PTES and PTS programs are using Section 804, rapid prototyping and fielding authorities provided by the Congress, and we're using other transaction authority contracting uh, authorities to do commercial SATCOM pathfinders, pilot efforts, and PTS concept development. We're also leveraging commercial space in SMC 2.0. Our Protected Tactical and Enterprise Services, or PTES, we're integrating uh, protected tactical waveforms into commercial SATCOM. That's our goal. We're procuring our WGS satellites 11 and 12 via our production core pace setter in as commercial a manner as we can possibly procure them. We're cutting satellite build times. We're cutting commercial standard. We're using commercial standards and parts. We're transferring risk with commercial best practices for mission assurance. And we're expecting that outcome to deliver us WGS and w, WGS 11 and 12 at, a, at an NTE cost that is, we'll just say, taxpayer friendly. Commercial SATCOM, we've got a number of pathfinders and pilots underway and I'm, my team will be talking about those uh, this week. We're moving faster through prototyping and development. We're doing deployments with those prototypes and we're taking advantage of residual capability. The Protected Tactical Service File Demonstrator Program develops a Protected Tactical Waveform modems with multiple contractors. Protected Tactical SATCOM is delivering satellite capability to the Navy, the warfighting Navy, up to 18 months early. We're replacing milestone decision processes with regular in-process reviews with the SAE. So those of you who are familiar with the FAR and the defense acquisition process, milestone decisions and how hard it is to get to those milestone decisions, under Section 804 authorities, we don't have to do those. We're instead going to take advantage of in-process reviews with Dr. Roper, our service acquisition executive, or the DAE, Secretary Lord, Secretary Ellen Lord, uh, the uh, uh, Undersecretary of Defense for ANS. Those in-process reviews, much less 
uh, bureaucracy associated with them much easier to accomplish than a formal milestone review. Dr. Roper has approved this program for uh, protected tactical SATCOM uh, in June, and uh, because he approved the program and we moved out, we saved over two years in the planning process. We've already awarded 13 different Space Enterprise Consortium other transaction agreements so that we can prototype and experiment on those kinds of things that we want to do here. And, they are expected, and our expected outcome is to field a bus agnostic SATCOM capability, getting payloads up in the air faster with better development cycles hosted on uh, commercial and international satellites. We're partnering with US, other U.S. government agencies as well. We've got a partnership office established, and so other, other agencies that we work with day in and day out, like NOAA and NASA and the Air Force's Rapid Capability Office, the new AFSPACE Space Rapid Capabilities Office, lots of partnerships ongoing in those areas. And as I've mentioned several times, we're desperately in need of leveraging all of you. We're desperately in need of leveraging all of you, but whether you're a traditional defense contractor or a non-traditional, whether you're an emerging supplier and you've got a good idea, we want to talk to you. We want to apply commercial best practices. We've got to do it. Next chart. Okay, so I'd like to invite all of you, first of all, to stop by the MILSATCOM booth in the, uh, uh, in the exhibit area uh, sometime this week and talk to some of my experts uh, from my MC or my MILSATCOM program office. Um, they will uh, obviously have way better details than I will, um, and uh, uh, I'm just uh, giving you a little food for thought up here uh, at this quick little speech. Military communications is the most important component of a strong and resilient military. Alfred T. Mahan knew it, and you know it. We span that bridge of those centuries between the two. We know how important this is to our military and to our nation. As a vital interest, the United States is significantly adding to our space situational awareness capabilities to ensure we can detect and attribute actions at uh, geosynchronous orbits and others. We understand the threats to our nation's government and commercial assets in space. To counter those threats effectively, we need to work together with allies and you, our commercial partners. We're moving faster by cutting red tape and delegating authority, and we need you to continue working with us through this process, including offering us suggestions on how we might go faster when somehow we don't see the light as clearly as you do. All right, thanks very much. I really uh, am looking forward to the next couple of days. I've got a number of my rock stars that will be up here uh, uh, in various sessions, uh, uh, giving you more gory details on uh, what I've talked about. I'd really appreciate it if you would stop by our booth. And now I'd like to open up the floor for some questions. What do you got? Three star in the wild. Hit, hit me with your best shot. Sir, the first question is, what are the implications for your command if the new Space Force is established as a separate branch of the military? Well, and, so, <laughs> go ahead, keep going. Is there more? And, and what are the implications for military space technology acquisitions? Yeah, so um, I, I think there's a couple of different ways to talk about that. First of all, uh, the United States Air Force is all in on, uh, on the Space Force concept, and uh, at all levels of uh, the United States Air Force, we have been contributing to the thinking on Space Force and how to make the President's vision um, a reality. Um, in terms of implications for uh, Space and Missile Systems Center, um, for those of you who have uh, visited our campus, which is uh, just a few blocks away, um, we have a, a, a very, very nice sculpture uh, that's uh, uh, been there uh, since the 1970s. It's called the Armillary. And if you walk around the base of the Armillary, there were, um, from 1954 until the present, uh, six different instantiations of the Space and Missile Systems Center. 
here's all I really know. Regardless of whether we have a United States Space Force or not, regardless of whether, um, uh, of how we decide to invest dollars in, uh, uh, in space materiel, you're going to need organizations and people that know how to do it to accomplish those uh, materiel functions. And so if I look strictly at my organic workforce, not including uh, some of my very, very strong and knowledgeable support contractors, not including my federally funded uh, research and development centers of aerospace and MITRE, just my organic workforce, military and civilian employees that have done space acquisition, um, I've got about 30,000 years of space acquisition experience um, uh, within the Space and Missile System Center. The U.S. Space Force is going to need experts on space acquisition, and so the implications for us really are we've got to execute our Space and Missile System Center 2.0 vision. We've got to get better. We've got to do things more in an enterprise way. We've got to develop new partnerships. We've got to be more innovative. We have to shift our culture, and we have to go faster to catch the threat or to maintain our advantage over the threat. And any space entity that needs materiel is going to need exactly that. So we're very excited about uh, uh, the various concepts of Space Force, and uh, we're just as anxious to figure out how it's going to end up as the rest of you. Next question. Sir, could you speak about your coalition partners? Are there liaison representatives in your command? Yeah, so um, we have had a tremendous history at uh, um, uh, Space and Missile System Center of, uh, of uh, having really good collaborative uh, relationships with a number of our partners. That, those collaborative relationships have resulted in a number of liaison officers over the years, primarily in the, the PNT, the Positioning, Navigation, and Timing Area in the GPS uh, program office, um, where we have a number of countries that over the years have provided uh, uh, foreign uh, liaison officers or uh, um, uh, collaboration, international collaborative uh, R&D kinds of, uh, of folks. We do, uh, we just though, uh, uh, under our uh, SMC 2.0 partnership office established our very first foreign liaison officer at the center level. And so uh, uh, our uh, friends in Great Britain have uh, provided us a, uh, um, a new representative at the center. And as I told a number of, uh, I think we had 34 uh, air attaches visiting SMC last week, as I told uh, a number of them, um, uh, during their visit, uh, the door is open. We are very, very interested in international partnerships and in foreign liaison officers at SMC. Um, we have allies, and in the space domain, very similar to how we do it in the air domain, the naval, do the sea domain, and the, and the ground domain, we should have strong international partnerships uh, with our allies, taking advantage of uh, unique capabilities, um, and uh, um, being able to resource things a little bit more robustly uh, with multi, multiple nations participating in our programs. Next chart, or I'm not next chart, next question. <laughs> Sir, how can a small business with mature, unique capabilities to protect, to protect space assets in contested environments have their technology evaluated for integration by the development core? Yeah, so um, I would say that you're under the SMC 2.0, your entree uh, into uh, a Space and Missile System Center as a small, non-traditional, uh, somebody who's very interested in getting an idea in front of us, is probably not straight into the development core or the production core, uh, probably not even with the PEO for space, um, probably more with our new portfolio architect uh, organization which is about 70, uh, currently 70, probably growing to about 100 folks, um, uh, led by Colonel Russ Tehan, uh, who is our portfolio architect, our integrator, uh, our chief partnership officer works for him. 
uh, and our chief innovation officer will work for him when we get our chief innovation officer hired. So the portfolio architect is really the team uh, to engage with. Um, and if you're interested in talking to them, then I think all you really need to do this week is uh, go visit the MIL SATCOM booth and uh, talk to uh, uh, our military satellite communications experts down there and they'll get you in touch with the right people. Sir, could you describe your ties to the academic institutions and how you promote research? Yeah, so um, there's a number of different uh, critical ties that we have with uh, um, uh, academic institutions uh, across the nation. Some of those academic institutions have associated with them federally funded uh, research and development centers, uh, as I previously mentioned, uh, institutions like uh, the Carnegie Mellon uh, Software Engineering Institute and the uh, MIT uh, Lincoln Labs. Uh, we also have representatives uh, uh, or engagements uh, across academia uh, through our um, uh, university applied uh, research centers, our UARCs, uh, like the Space Dynamics Lab at uh, Utah State University in uh, Logan, Utah. But we have a lot of other opportunities that we can take advantage of uh, through our uh, Space Enterprise Consortium uh, vehicle, which is uh, managed out of Kirtland Air Force Base and currently has over 200 uh, uh, members on it, including a number of academic institutions. Uh, we are very interested in talking more with uh, academia. Uh, had the opportunity to uh, uh, visit uh, the Valley here uh, last month. Uh, went up and uh, engaged with the uh, Defense Innovation Unit uh, down by the old uh, Moffett Field and uh, had an engagement with Stanford University uh, uh, during that uh, quick two-day visit uh, uh, to Silicon Valley. So we're very interested in uh, additional partnerships and the innovative opportunities that our nation's uh, um, very uh, um, high profile uh, academic institutions uh, offer us. And so if you're uh, a representative of one of those uh, schools, one of those universities, and you'd like to chat, then just, just let us know. Thanks. Sir, how will the US Air Force leverage large commercial constellations? Mm. So um, right now, we're doing a lot of um, uh, experimenting, uh, demonstrating, and prototyping. And I think uh, large commercial uh, constellations uh, uh, have some tremendous benefits that we need to experiment on uh, further. I'm uh, just a little uh, reticent to commit to doing all sorts of, of our uh, nation's missions right this second. Um, when you start talking about large commercial constellations, um, I, uh, I, you know, one of the one of the areas that uh, um, uh, that we're uh, working on right now with DARPA is a program called Blackjack, where we're going to look at uh, uh, com large commercial constellations in Leo. Um, what I find interesting about the discussions of large uh, uh, large constellations right now, particularly in Leo, is that everybody always wants to talk about the payload oh, hey, we could do remote sensing, we can do weather, we can do comms, we can, there, we can do PNT, or we can just do timing. You know, there's all these great, and it's a really, really interesting, fun discussion to talk about all of the different payloads that might be possible hosted on large commercial constellations, particularly in LEO. But at this point in the maturity of, that, of those uh, constellations, I'm actually more interested in satellite control. I'm more interested in, okay, are we going to, how are we going to control a 500 or 800 or 1,000 satellite constellation? And a lot of people today that are very, very knowledgeable on things like the, uh, you know, the different payloads that might be possible on those 1,000 satellite constellations, they, they love to kind of hand wave that, oh yeah, we're just going to use, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, 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 artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence will manage that, uh, that 1,000 satellite constellation. I, I, I'm hoping that's true, but I'd like to see it in action a little bit before I commit to, to uh, uh, going all in 
on uh, uh, low Earth orbit uh, commercial satellite uh, constellations that have over 500 satellites in them. I'd like to experiment a little, do some demonstrations, uh, do some prototyping. I mean, you know, I, I mentioned uh, iPhones earlier. I, you know, I, I love the product, but sometimes uh, my Siri cannot find the closest Panera Bread, right? Um, and, you know, and I know it's there, and I know exactly where it's at, but Siri can't find it. Um, and uh, it, it, I don't want to run into that same situation with uh, uh, satellites in low Earth orbit, okay? So uh, how we grow that and how we control those uh, constellations is really important to me. Next question. That was our final question. Okay. So well, <laughs> again, uh, welcome to, uh, uh, well, maybe not sunny just yet, but give it an hour or so, uh, to uh, sunny Southern California. Uh, enjoy your time here. Uh, please stop by our Milsatcom booth and see some of the rock stars that work at the United States Air Force's Space and, and Missile Systems Center and uh, have a great conference. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.